for a Sunday. Some, sometimes that, that can be a terrifying thing because you're not quite sure the person is going to be, you know, talking what they're going to say. And so I'm real sensitive to that. And I had asked Julian, well, what would be one of the things that you would like me to sort of speak on? And immediately he says, I want you to, you know, have the freedom to do what the Lord puts on your heart. But uh, I, want, I would like you to talk about Philippians and the great relationship that Paul had with the church, church at Philippi and the fantastic relationship that he had. And so what I'd like you to do is to be able to turn to your Bibles, and we'll start off with this, in Philippians 2, verses 19 through 24. Okay, so I'll give you a little bit of a second there. I had to bring my travel Bible with me this week here, you know, for light, light travels and things. So Paul is writing to the church in Philippi, and he says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare, for everyone who looks out for their own interest and not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself. Because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope therefore to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. And I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come to you again soon. So what we see in these passages is the depth of relationship. We see the partnership. We see the concern in following our verses of Epaphroditus who had actually been sent by the church of Philippi to go help Paul when he was in prison. So you see a real reciprocation of love and partnership. And the relationship is the key part. And I want to sort of backtrack a little bit of like, because I think it's important to the story of Philippi, of how we, how uh, we were able to bring myself, Becca, and JC here. Because some of you asked, how in the world do you know Julian? And I think you're starting to find it seems like Julian knows a little bit of everybody and, and things. So, but it sort of goes back a little bit, uh, sort of continuing with my story. Is in about 2011, I could just sense I, I just turned, uh, well, a, a little over 50 years old. And I just started sensing that the Lord was just starting to turn and turn some things in my life. And he basically was like, all those other years, this is in preparation for something that I have for you. And it was one of those things where I was, I was talking to my dad, and he lives clear up in the northwest in the state of Montana. And a great, great Christian man. I've just been so blessed to have an earthly father like him. And I, I said, Dad, it's like i got so many different things burning in my heart, and I just don't know what they are. And it was literally a period of like four or five months. I mean, I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where the Lord's burning something in your heart. You're just absolutely miserable. And you're wrestling and you're fasting and you're praying. And it just, I, you know, I was just so frustrated with it. And so finally, it was one of those, it was a morning in April. And the Lord basically, he said, I'm going to hold you responsible for the remainder of your life to do whatever I call and task you to do for the revitalization of America. Because I know here in Britain we see the American church as all, you know, it's great, it's grand, it's got all these people that are going to church and everything. But the fact of the matter is they're a dead man walking. Okay, to coin a, I don't remember what movie that that was out of, but the fact of the matter is this, there are a lot of problems in the American church. We are only just a, a, a few steps behind Britain in its spiritual health. It's not in a good state. And even in, within the churches that are large, there are so many things that are growing wrong. And we have what we call Christian consumerism, where people, they, they love the worship. There used to be a saying many years ago that you know, the worship might be great, but unfortunately, a lot of times people are just worshiping the worship. Or they just like the program, 
or they just like the sermon, or they just like these things, and it's like going into the, the carvery, the buffet, you know, and just, I'll take a little bit of that and a little bit of this. Oh, that doctrine stuff, or, you know, well, Jesus said, well, you know, I'm not really into that type of thing. And so it's really caused a cosmetic appearance of health, where in fact, there is a lot of death and things that are working on. So the church is not in a really good state. You can have a conversation with any church, anybody in a church. Right? You can line up 100 people from that church and have a conversation of, so what is your daily devotion relationship in the Word and in prayer like? And they just go, well, I'm, I'm just too busy to do that. i got too many things going on. And to even have that conversation is very, very difficult. So these are one of the things that we just talk about. And so still in the military at that time. And then shortly after that, the Lord had really put it on my heart to go back to school. I do not recommend, okay, those of you who are under 50, I do not recommend going back to school after age 50. That is a young person's sport, okay? <laughs> so here I am, I'm like 52 years old, and uh, I'm in a PhD program, and most of my classmates, I have some, you know, three or four of them, they're in their late 20s. Probably 10 of them, they're in their four or 30s, and then a smattering of, you know, one or two in their 40s, and then here's, you know, grandpa, you know, you know and white hair and the whole thing. But what ended up happening during that period of time is as we were looking and studying things, it was an opportunity for the Lord to start seeding and working in my heart some new things. And part of that was some of the, the topic that I immediately became interested in was of a guy named Charles Grant. Many people in England do not even know who he is, but he is one of the greatest Christians in the history of England. He was the CEO or the director of the British East India Company in the late uh, 1700s and early 1800s. At the point in time, and I know when in Britain, most people in the United States don't know much about the British East India Company, but when you're in Britain, you go like, oh yeah, that was that really just corrupt organization. And it was, it was highly corrupt. What a lot of people don't know is that was the largest multinational corporation in the history of mankind to date. It is bigger than Walmart. It is bigger than any other corporation. It had more employees. It had more uh, contribution to a nation's gross domestic product than any other nation in history. It contributed to 20% of England's finances in the 1700s. That is the reason why England economically became the world and then eventually the military power that it did, was because of that corporation. Unfortunately, it fleeced many nations to be able to get there. So Charles Grant, he came to faith in 19, or 19, 1776. And he was living in India at the time. And the Lord really burned something in his heart that this is wrong. And he was just a clerk in a warehouse. And within a period of 20 some odd years, he became the number one person. And one of the things that he was looking at, it was England's responsibility for the welfare of India. And he had to convince his corporation, he had to convince British Parliament, he had to convince the business folks in England and the people in India that they needed Christ. And at that point in time, England was at its lowest point spiritually, even much more so now than nowadays. So to make a long story short, what ended up happening is the Lord started in my heart as he had burned America on my heart to revitalize it. He did the same thing in my heart for England. I had been praying for the Lord to put on my heart to start praying and fasting every Friday morning or every Friday for America. And he says, you need to add England to that as well too. So England has been burned in my heart 
for the better part of the last five or six years. What was interesting, this is my third trip here. The first trip was our university, our PhD class had come back in like about 2014. I came back in 2016 to do some research and things, and so I, I invited my father along, and so he rode shotgun for 10 days as we went looking through all the libraries for corporate documents of the British East India Company and personal letters of Charles Grant, and just what an amazing story, an amazing man. But one of the things I also learned was about my heritage and faith as well, too, my family faith. And what I come to find out is I can trace my English heritage back to 23 generations, all the way back to Hungerford, England, to the very first one, and had the distinct pleasure on three different occasions to go visit Hungerford. And my relatives had actually created two different churches and things. And you know how in a lot of the older English churches they'll have people in the wall, you know, or some effigies to them. And, and just some of the things that were there that they were great men and women of God. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, this spiritual heritage has been going on since like the, the 1200s. And what was interesting is I told you about my grandfather. He came to faith at 16. And for... For basically 70 years, he told God, I don't want to have a thing to do with you until he came back and renewed his faith at age 86. It's just amazing how the Lord can do this. And the spiritual heritages we have is so important. England has an amazing spiritual heritage. England, in the late, 1800, late 1700s, early 1800s, did more than any other generation and nation in the history of mankind to reach the world and do the Great Commission since the first century church. It's on many of these shores in Brighton where we sent Hudson Taylor out, William Carey, and many of those people. You have an amazing spiritual heritage, and God wants to renew that. And because of that very thing, that's why I'm here. That's why Grace is here. Because our senior pastor, Aaron, is a young boy. His father was in the Air Force as well, too. He was here for four or five years and attended English schools. So at a young age, the Lord had burned England into his heart. Five years ago, our youth pastor, Jeff, he had come to England for some youth event and he was in a different church and the Lord told him, England. And one of the things that I'm responsible for as associate pastor, I have 40, it's crazy, I have 40 different programs that I'm responsible for. One of those areas is outreach and then missions. And one of the things that a lot of Christian uh, American churches do is what I call Christian vacations. We go ahead, we book a bunch of people to go to Haiti or the Dominican Republic or England or Germany. And for a week, we go ahead and we travel around, you know, and knock on a couple of doors and stuff like that, high five each other, check off our Christian checklist like, oh, yeah, we were missionaries and we had a great thing. And, and so two weeks later, all the things that they've done are for naught. They don't take what they learned and what God spoke to them and try to do the same thing. And that's one of the things I said, we're not going to do that. When we go, we're going to seek out a place. We're going to intentionally seek the Lord in a place that we are going to partner. We are going to support the mission and vision that the Lord has put on their heart. We are going to become invested. Much like we read in Second Philippians of what Paul had done with the Philippian churches that well too. And that's what the Lord has done. We realized, it was about a year ago, Jeff, Aaron, and I were talking because we had been praying, our missions program, our missions focus is broken. Where do we want to go? And we did not know 
that individually the Lord had been pricking our hearts for England. And it was, I think it was within two weeks that we realized that, that uh, the university that I'm a part of uh, doing my PhD work is Dallas Baptist University. So I connected with them because they come once a year over here as well. I asked if they knew of anybody and they couldn't find anyone. Jeff had known and had some connections with FIEC. FIEC gave us Julian's name. And immediately there was that bond. There was that connection. So we've been, we've been talking for well over a year. So we just didn't just show up. God's been working on this for a long time. He has a plan. He has a purpose. And we're excited to be a part of what that is. And we want to help in whatever way that we are capable to be able to do. This has been an amazing week. But let's go ahead and tie this a little more into the Philippian church. Because what we're going to do... I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of the church in Philippi. I'm not going to give you an exhaustive study or anything like that, but just give you an idea from the partnership, what those things were, why it was important, and what are some of the takeaways that are going to be really applicable. And one of the things that was interesting is I had been working with the message for the better part of a couple of weeks, and yesterday I was... I, I was still like, they're just, there's something just not right. There's something missing a little bit. And I had taken Becca and JC into uh, to Heathrow, and I had some plans where I still needed to do a little bit of research for my uh, dissertation to just try to get a little bit more on Charles Grant. And so I was able to look at the church that he had actually had worshipped at. Clapham uh, Church. I don't know if you guys have heard of the name of the Clapham Saints, or they call them the Clapham Sect, and that was supposed to be a disparaging remark from uh, one of the left papers that were in that century that was disparaging against those people. But what was really interesting, in the Church of Clapham, it was 30 people that turned this nation around. It was 30 people that actually said, we need to go out. We need to be able to go ahead and touch the world that's around us. Their focus and the mission that God had burned on their heart was to deal with the political elite, the economically powerful, and from a global perspective. We also had John Wesley that was the Lord that burned on his heart, the workers, and the things that they were responsible for. And so the intersection of those two, what the Lord did was amazing. But it was 30 people that changed the course of history in an amazing way. And you probably heard of William Wilberforce, I would imagine, okay? William Wilberforce and Charles Grant were best buds. They actually introduced their own legislation, each other's legislation, into British Parliament. And they lived next to each other in Clapham Common, right there. And what is interesting as well is this just didn't happen. The family started coming together in the early 1700s. They were the second and third generation of believers that had the common vision. But it started off with 30 people. And one of the things that the Lord had told Zechariah after the temple foundation, they had come back after 70 years and King Cyrus had gone ahead and allowed them to be able to go ahead and come out of captivity in Babylon and they celebrated and they came and they went and they built the foundation of the temple but because of persecution and strife and a little bit of infighting and we started getting a little American comfortable and stuff and they stopped building. And Zechariah, 15 years later, was burdened by the Lord to say, do not despise the day of the small thing. Continue at the task that I have given you. And that's going to be one of the things I'm going to communicate to you guys. You, you think you're small. You think you can't do much. Oh, you guys are doing an amazing amount. And I want to talk about some of those things as well. But what was interesting is, is I was 
gone to all, the Clapton Church. I went to where Grant's home was when he died. I went to the church that he was attending when he died yesterday as well, too. And in all three visits that I've, when I've come to, to Britain, I have been just struck with just grief when I see all the old churches in realizing those were monuments to the work that God had put in the heart of people. And now they're supermarkets or they're just a facade or they have other things that are going on. And you see that's just a slow death of something that was once great in one of the greatest nations spiritually ever in the history to include, I believe, the first century church. And so I hadn't had uh, my devotion time uh, yesterday in my reading. And so finally, after I'd gone through the sites, I was on the bus and coming down the old London road to come from London, from the Victoria coach station down here. And the Lord put on my heart to read in Nehemiah. And Nehemiah is very, very applicable because the story of Nehemiah is this. It had been about 140 years that King Cyrus had gone ahead to let some of the people go and come. And so there had been some things that were going on. And so Nehemiah, in chapter 1, one of his kinsmen has returned. So this is like about an 800 to 1,000 mile journey. So that's really quite something to get somebody to come back. Nehemiah goes like, how's it going? And he goes like, it's not going good. The people are spiritually just dead and the walls are down and the gates are still torn down. And he goes like, well, I thought they built the temple. Well, they did, but they stopped. And so Nehemiah immediately, starting at verse 6 of chapter 1, he goes and he starts and he confesses to the Lord and he starts for four months, he starts praying. Lord, forgive us, forgive this nation, forgive this people for what they've done. Forgive me. Four months he continues to entreat and finally, at the end of the four months, one day he's before King Artaxerxes. And Artaxerxes, because he was the cupbearer, so that's a very, very prestigious position. A great position of trust. And Nehemiah says, well, Artaxerxes says, you seem a little depressed today. What's going on? And he says, oh, king, how can I, when my people and my city and God's city is in ruins, how in the world can I rejoice? He says, what do you wish? Very interesting, the word that Nehemiah used. If I have found favor with you, let me do this. And so he does that, and he allows him to be able to go. And so, in chapter 2, Nehemiah, he's, he gets there. He's there for three days, and then one night he breaks off, and he starts going around the wall, sort of car, counterclockwise from where the temple is. And the rubble and the ruins is so pervasive that he, in places, cannot even take his donkey to go over. He's got to dismount. And so what has happened is he's taking a survey. He hasn't told anybody what the Lord had burned into his heart. And he goes ahead and he tells the people finally in the morning that why he was there. And if you could turn with me to Nehemiah 2, 17 through 18, he provides a challenge. One of the things that's interesting about Nehemiah is they say, oh, he was a great architect, a great builder, and things like that. No, he was a cupbearer in the king's court. He did not have the skill set to do what he was doing. Okay? But what he did is he understood what God was speaking into his heart, and he was obedient. And he was comfortable. He was in a great position of prestige and power and trust. Yet he gave all that up because God had asked him to do something. And so after he's surveyed the damage and he's come back, and he finally he says in verse 17, Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in Jerusalem. It lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. We will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand my God had on me and what the king had said to me. 
and then replied, let us start rebuilding. And so they began the good work. Yesterday, as I was coming down the old London road, there are churches on the left, there are churches on the right that are in dis disrepair. I, I was in absolute grief and tears yesterday. It is, it's just humbling to see that how God had done something so great and we just see vestiges of the past. But I know as Zechariah was told through the Lord, do not despise, despise the day of the small thing, that we understand that with the Clapham saints, it only took 30 of them to be obedient. So the thing that I find really interesting is, is this, is in the church of Philippi, it had a culture, it was a Roman outpost at the time, it had 10,000 people that were in it. So as Paul goes ahead and he comes, he actually, his first visit is 51 AD, okay? And they think, they know for sure he came three, maybe four times, but Paul, he comes into a place where there are no Jews. He had actually had been doing very well, obviously, in Asia. And one night, they're looking to go further into Asia, and the Lord, it says, the Holy Spirit prohibited him. But he continued to try. So one night, he actually had a man appear in a dream and says, you guys from Macedonia, so from Philippi, come here, come help us. I think the guy's name was Julian, by the way, <laughs> from over the pond. Because <laughs> it was over across. So the church of Philippi was the first church in Europe ever. So that's pretty significant because when Paul actually goes and he walks into to Philippi, there is no Jewish synagogue. And that had been the way they did typically done things. He had first go to the synagogue. He had, you know, talk to them about the things of Jesus. 50% of the time, things would go pretty well. It persuade them a little bit. Then the other Jews would go like, hey, we don't like what you're saying here. And then they'd throw them out of the town. Okay. But this was different. So one of the things that he did is he had heard that there were prayers that were out down by the, the river. And so he runs in to the lady Lydia. She's from Thyatira. She is actually uh, you know, in the, the, the color dyeing business and the, the clothing business and stuff like that. So she comes to Christ. They start preaching to the Gentiles and a lot of the people start coming to faith. Then all of a sudden what happens is there's this young girl that's following him around and going like, listen, this is, he's talking about the, the king of the most high God. Listen to him. So Paul gets annoyed after this for a few days and casts the spirit out. Well, she actually is, uh, how can I put it, more like a fortune teller type of thing and was her, she was employed by people and they were profiting from it. Well, they were losing their money. So they go to the Romans and say, look, it, this guy is saying some illegal things and he's stirring the pot here a little bit. He's making, he's disrupting our community. It's a community of about 10,000 people at this point in time. So they immediately jail him. And then this is where we read that Paul and Silas are worshiping in the Lord. And at midnight, the earthquake, and it shakes it up. And they let him loose and the Philippine jailer is getting ready to, to kill himself. And he, Paul says, no, don't harm yourself. Everybody's here. We're good to go. So the Philippine jailer immediately comes in. What must I do to be saved? And so he takes them home, cleans them up, washes them up. The whole family gets saved. God is moving in amazing ways because it's relevant. It's new. It's, they see Christ in them regardless of the situation that they find themselves in. So in the morning, they, I mean, how do you like that conversation? Well, we, we cleaned you, we fed you a little bit. You know, thanks for not letting me kill myself. Oh, by the way, I need to put you back in the prison cell. You know, can you imagine what that conversation was like? And Paul and Silas, okay, yeah, sure, we'll do that. Well, in the morning, the magistrates, they go like, yeah, well, let's go ahead and let them go. And that's when Paul drops the I'm a Roman citizen bomb. And they go ahead and they go like, you know what? You just create too much trouble. Can you go away? 
So Paul is gracious. And so on his third missionary journey, three years later, he stops by. And we read about this in Acts 20. Another three years later on the, ret later, on the return side of the third missionary journey, he goes ahead and he drops by. And so uh, it is about five years after that that he writes the letter to the Philippians. So there's this relationship. They have at least three visits. This is where he says, I can't wait to be able to send Timothy to you. And according to church history, they're not really, they don't think that he actually ever made it there. But that's not the point. You can see the heart of partnership and camaraderie that is actually there. They think he may have actually, on the way to Rome in 65 AD, may have made a final visit to the Philippian church. But the thing about it is, is you go through and you look at the story, not just the verses, not just the theology, not just the doctrine, but the heart. They valued their partnership with the gospel, and Paul helped them in that. In reciprocating, the Philippians had sent Epaphroditus with financial gifts to be able to help, with other things as well, too. Chapter 4, we read where they really express their concern for Paul. And they, again, they had financially supported uh, Paul many, many years. And really, they were the only church in Europe that actually ever helped. And even some of the Asian churches, they were the only one that helped. Some of the key ideas and themes that we read from Philippians really show us a lot about the relationship. So, for example, one of the opening verses, Paul writes, he who has begun a good work in you will bring it to completion. That's so important for us to remember nowadays. For me to live, or for me to live as Christ and to die is gain. He's writing this from a prison cell. Chapter 2, let this mind be in you which is also in Christ Jesus. So the transforming and the renewing of our mind, being in his word, making sure that he is preeminent and not us. We sometimes fail to realize these are not our hands. This is not our voice. These are not our feet. These are not our lives. They're his lives to be lived out for his purpose. Chapter 2, he also talks about work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God that is in the will to work in you. He has the ability to work to be able to even have the desire to have the things for him. It's so one thing I learned many years ago. There was a time where I just, I was going through a spiritual dry spot and I was honest. I says, Lord, I don't even want to read. I know I need to. I don't want to pray, but I know I need to. Give me the desire to be able to do that. I mean, how pathetic is that? I didn't even have the desire. And I had to go to him to ask him to give me the desire. And so Paul recognizes that and he encourages them. He says, I count all things as lost for the excellence and the knowledge of Christ. And he closes that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Some of the extra biblical history that is very interesting is we know that John in Revelations in chapters 2 and 3, he had talked about the seven churches in Asia. One of those churches, he goes and he writes the first one. He talks to the church of Ephesus. You're doing all the great, great things. You're working hard. You are uh, doing the doctrine correctly. You, you know, continue to have your hand to it. But I have this one thing against you. That you have lost your first love. In the church of Philippi, you see love. You see engagement, you see compassion, you see house-to-house -house interaction with the believers. The church in Ephesus didn't last very long after John wrote uh, Revelation. They think maybe only another 50, maybe another 100 years. But the church of Philippi, they flourished until 600 AD, right around that time when an earthquake Amazing, you know, the earthquake with Paul in the jail. There's another earthquake, but it completely destroyed the city. They grew from 30 believers 
when Paul left in 51 AD to 1,900 believers 300 years later. They became 20% of the population of Philippi. And here's, I think, the reason why. Emperor Trajan, that was still at the time when he was emperor of the Roman Empire, it was still, Christianity was illegal. It was actually called a pagan or even an atheist religion because anything that was contrary to the Roman gods was known as atheism. Yeah, it's sort of a weird turn of terminology, isn't it? And so one of the local governors in the area of Philippi goes like, we got all these Christians. What do you want me to do with them? Because, I mean, there's so many of them. Do you want us to throw them in jail? There's not enough room in the jails here. What do you want us to do? Because we're right at 2,000. One out of five people are a Christian in Philippi when he's writing this letter. What is so interesting, and again, this is extra biblical, so this is not in scripture. So whenever I talk about something like that, I just take this with a grain of salt, but the observation is interesting. Here's a quote. This is Emperor Trajan back to this regional governor that's in Philippi. Why do we not observe that it is their benevolence to strangers, their care for the graves of the dead, and it's out of Philippians? I'm going to sort of personalize it a little bit. From Grace Bible Church, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Brighton New Life. Together with the elders and the deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We will thank our God every time that we remember you. In our prayers for all of you, we always pray with you because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident in this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it out into completion until the day of Jesus Christ. That's our prayer and will continue to be our prayer for you guys. Mm -hmm.